Well, here's, uh, here's our first night of EBS, and uh, just for all of you who are professional clock watchers, you know who you are. Some of you went to the Olympics because you were so good at watching the clock during sermons, you gold medaled in it. Um, but uh, we are going until 8 o'clock. That's the time I was told that class is over. Uh, so we've got 41 minutes uh, to, uh, to study tonight, and so glad that you're here. I hope you'll continue to come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, uh, and uh, enjoy being together. Enjoy. Uh, do, you, do you feel energized just from being around the kids? I mean, just seeing the energy that's up here, does, do you, does that energy kind of, does it flow back to you, or do you feel extra tired now? Um, I mean, is, is, does it build you up in, in, in strength, or is it like wear you out and think, oh, wow, I don't have any of that? Um, you know, so let it be encouraging. Don't be discouraged. Uh, and so what we're going to do tonight is we are going to try to finish what we started this morning in our Bible class hour and did not finish. And uh, we will try to finish it tonight, although um, I can't make any promises, but uh, we were talking about human evolution this morning. Uh, is that, that pretty popular, the concept, the teaching uh, about human evolution? Is that uh, pretty prevalent today? It's, it's everywhere. It's, it's the accepted norm uh, in, in, uh, in, in our world, as, as scary as that is. So is there evidence to support it? Does the evidence support human evolution? No, there, there's not any. And so what we did this morning is we talked a little bit about the fossil record, and that's what we're going to finish up talking about here uh, in just a couple minutes, uh, is we looked at the fossil record and said, okay, is there any evidence for the fossil record uh, as it is, uh, as it is uh, given to us? And this isn't, this isn't the official chart, okay? Uh, there are a variety of different charts that you can find that would show the official uh, progression of these single-cell uh, organisms that go all the way through the uh, amphibians, the reptiles, up through the, the chimps and the monkeys, and all the way down to human beings. Uh, obviously, you've seen a number of charts that look like that. Is there any evidence to support that? Uh, and so what we did this morning is we covered the first of these two. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, the evidences that have been used uh, to support human evolution are inadequate. What does that mean? What does inadequate mean? Not enough. All right? There's not enough. And, and did you notice as we went through the, uh, the dismantling of some of the, that evidence that it was the evolutionists that we were quoting to say there's not enough here. But it's out there, and hopefully we'll find the evidence one day, but it's not here. It was evolutionists that were admitting that. And then we looked at the, some erroneous evidences, and that's, that's where we talked about the different, uh, the different pieces of bones that had been found and how they had found a tooth and created a whole man, except it was a pig tooth, and how they had found just a jawbone or, uh, or maybe a skull cap and they created a whole man, or how they found a, uh, an elephant's uh, kneecap and they created a, a oh, they, they thought that was evidence of evolution. It's like, wait a minute. Not, so the, all of those things were kind of... Uh, and over time, they finally admitted, oh, wait, there's no there there, even with that. Uh, and so here, here's, I, I want to finish that thought on the evidence that, is, that they have being erroneous with this comment. These things are being dismantled by creationists, okay? Creationists are saying, no, this stuff is not real, and they are creation scientists are finding holes in their arguments. But what I want you to notice is we haven't quoted those. We've been quoting the evolutionary scientists who are themselves realizing, oh, wait, no, what we've been... So at least they've been honest on that level. But what's interesting is while they back away and say, no, there's no evidence there, what do they continue to believe in? evolution. Isn't that interesting? To say, oh no, the evidence we used to use is no longer valid, but we still believe in this. So who is it that has a blind faith? Who is it that has a faith that doesn't have any evidence for it? That's not us. And so I want to share with you one other quote 
to, uh, to let you see that it is, not, uh, it is not the creationists that are the ones who are bringing, we are bringing this to light, but it's interesting that it's not us that are the ones that are out in front being noticed. So here, here's, what, uh, here's what a popular skeptic by the name of Michael Shermer has to say. He's uh, the executive director, uh, as you can see, of uh, a group called Skeptic Society. So Skeptic Society, that sounds like people who believe in God, right? Believe in creation? No. Well, look, look notice, notice what he says. Hoaxes like pilt, uh, Piltdown Man. We talked about Piltdown Man this morning, being one little piece of bone, and they created a whole uh, structure, and they said, oh, wait, no, that's, that's not really human evolution. Uh, hoaxes like Piltdown Man and honest mistakes like Nebraska Man. Remember Nebraska Man was the one tooth that created the whole person? Uh, Calaveras Man. He said, these hoaxes and these honest mistakes are in time exposed. In fact, he says, it was not creationists who exposed these errors, it was scientists who did so. I would take issue with the fact that he makes a difference between creationists and scientists, as if creationists are not reliable scientists. Do you know any creationists who are reliable scientists? I know a lot. So to, to try to draw a line there's all, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not the creationists that have figured this out, it's the scientists. Uh, that, that's kind of a slap, as it were, creationists. But what is he admitting? He's admitting that it's these evolutionary scientists who have come out with this. Nicole, were you, did you say something? He's admitting, they're wrong. They're, he's admitting that they're wrong. And yet, what do they continue to follow? Uh, that, that part of it just, it just amazes me that and so I think we need to kind of take stock in that and say, wait a minute, I need to make sure that my faith is not a blind faith. I need to make sure that my faith is not just going along with what everybody else believes in the church or whatever, everything else that I've heard. I need to make sure that I know the evidence and that I can, that I can teach the evidence, that I can defend the evidence. Dirk? I find it funny that you use the term Right. Right. Yeah, and, and that, that, that bothers me too. You know, Dirk says, you know, to call them honest mistakes, you know, when, when you take a tooth that you have found and you create a whole evolution, a, a transitional creature to prove evolution from a tooth, and it ends up being a wild pig's tooth instead, it's just like, wait a minute. But you, 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 you created all of this with no evidence is to your point is that an honest mistake or is it and again we need to be careful that we that we don't fall into the same trap of trying to prove something without evidence on our side that we don't go so far to prove a point that we will say things that the bible does not say we need, and i'm not talking just about i'm talking about anything uh, in in the realm of christianity we make sure we don't go beyond what the scriptures say nicole Well, it, you're right. Here, here, here's, here's a question for you. What is it that our society wants to hear when it comes to the matter of our origin? Do they want to hear proof for evolution, or do they want to hear about creation? If they can, they, and so do they care if the proof is valid? Apparently not, because it's just here in mountains, full, but they just, they, they are, they're just craving a little bit more to prove what they think is real and true, but it's not. But think about that in relationship to so many things today. Not just this. When, when, when people, when, uh, how, how, why is it that about every mm, 10 or 15, 20 years that some, some, some new discovery will be made that we have found the bones of Jesus over here in this, in this cave. And you know that story gets recycled? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's just like it, it comes out, it gets disproven, it gets shut down, it says, no, that's not true. They, they put it back in their little corner until a few years later, and they think, well, maybe some people have forgotten this. We'll bring it back out, and we'll say, oh, a new discovery. And no, it's, it's just the same old thing wrapped in a new, in new wrapping paper. Have you ever re-gifted something? It's like, get over it already, all right? We don't want this stuff. You know, how many times, you know, whether it's the bones of Jesus, or, oh, wow, we found these books that are missing from the Bible. You know how often they recycle it? You can't trust the Bible because here's all. No, it's the same story that's been disproved all of these times over and over. They're just bringing it back out again because why? Because people will grab a hold of it. People, yeah, we want to hear that. Wait a minute. Their evidence keeps falling apart right in the midst of their fingers. What about our evidence? Our evidence doesn't fall apart. It remains true. It remains strong. Bob, it looks like you've got your hand up, not up. I couldn't tell if you were like waving at me or what. Exactly. Right. 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 No, the, you're, they're they're not going to be taught the mistakes, um, and that, and that's that's the sad part. So, we've got inadequate evidence. We've got the erroneous evidence, um, and then there's. What, uh, what Apologetics Press is labeling as the Irrelevant, irrelevant evidence. Yes, Maxine. Before, when Jesus happened uh, and, and after, and the thunder came in the thunderstorms, it changed the language, and it changed the language. Is that is that when the first man was? Is that, is that what they're talking about? Um, well, there's... Uh, and, and, and when we turn to the Bible, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 about how man was made and how man sinned and was, um, was removed from the Garden of Eden. And then you read from Genesis 4 through Genesis 10 about man populating that region, not necessarily populating the earth, but populating the region uh, that was around there. And then you get to Genesis chapter 11, if that's what we're asking about, uh, where they built what we call the Tower of Babel. Um, and at that point, man was scattered uh, because of the events there. And due to that scattering, we have nations being developed and nations being created in various parts of the earth. And, be, and I, don't, I don't know if this is the question, but because of the genetic makeup that was there at Babel, the genetic makeup that was in man and woman, in Adam and Eve uh, from the beginning, when these various people went to these various places of the earth, all of a sudden they might look a little bit different, they, they might have a different appearance than others, but they all trace their origin back to Adam and Eve. Um, God changed their language at Babel they went to the different places. They might have talked differently. They might have looked differently. But they were all still from the same persons. Still the same origin. Still the same beginning. I don't, uh, Maxine, I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's what you're asking about. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. All right, good. Um, so, ir ir irrelevant evidence. What does irrelevant mean? Um, doesn't apply. You know, they're, they're just bringing things up. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a discussion with somebody and they thought they had a great point to make and then you looked at it and say, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. That happened? That's irrelevant, right? Um, and, and yet, even, even as you're going to see in some of their irrelevant evidence, is like, wait a minute, that doesn't even hold true anyway. Um, and so I, I don't want to get real deep into some of this. Here's the thing. I told you this this morning. Um, here's the thing with some of this stuff from Apologetics Press. Um, 
you know, if, I, I don't know how to quantify this. I, I feel like my, in, my intelligence is somewhere around like a 27 or 28 level of intelligence. Um, and this stuff is coming from Jeff Miller, who's got like an 85, I don't know, I'm just making these numbers up, but he's, he's like on an 85 level, and I'm down here on a 27 level, right? And so I'm trying to read and understand it so that I know what I'm talking about, right? So I'm not just standing up here and saying words that I have no idea what they are. Um, and so I don't want to get into some of this that I can't fully explain. There's a lot there. Uh, you can go on their website uh, and, and learn quite a bit. But here, here's this question on this irrelevant evidence. And that is, okay, we've seen some of these other things in the, um, in the inadequate and the erroneous part of this. What about the other Things. What about the species that are not yet acknowledged as hoaxes? And, and here, here's what they're looking at, and I don't know that you can read this. I know this is very small. I couldn't adjust this because it was on, uh, on their, on their, uh, in their PowerPoint embedded in it. But they divided up our different, um, different in, in their minds, the same species, but they label these all uh, together. And so I don't know if you can read these, the different Homo and then the uh, different Australopithecus, and I know that's horrible to try to interpret, um, but these are, these are, they, they want to make them out to be the same. They want to put all of these into the same category, even though they're, they're labeled differently. Uh, and so what creationists have done is to help us to see, wait a minute, Creationists and evolutionists don't look at things, they don't classify uh, fossils, they don't classify um, living creatures in the same way. What does that mean? Creationists look at mankind, they look at, they look at all of, cre all of create creatures that have been on the face of the earth, and what they do is they classify by looking for both similarities and differences in fossils. You, say, you, you might think that makes sense. So you look at the fossil record, and they're looking for things that are similar between these fossil records, and they're looking for things that are different between these fossil records so that they can put them into different categories. So if you remember this morning's lesson, that's how you know the difference between a, 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 a rib from a dolphin and a rib from a human, because they're different, right? And so creation has put these things into obviously different categories categories. Evolutionists don't do that. In evolutionist ca classification system, what they do, they're not even looking for differences. All they're doing is looking for similarities. Now, why would that be? Why would they not be looking for... So, so when, when, they, when they're considering all of these different species that, that are, have been and are on the earth, they're not looking for the differences between... They're always looking and only looking for the similarities. Why would that be? Say it again. Okay, because it helps to prove their point. Okay, Romans chapter 1, they're worshiping the, the creation, not the creator. If you believed, if you, and let me see, how many clicks is it going to take me to get back here? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a, okay, so, if you believed that this is how we came to be, then you would believe that we are all tied together. Right? And so you, if you're looking for where does a fossil fit, you're only looking for similarities because you believe we are all similar. Because we are all from the same single-celled organism. So you're not interested in differences. One, as Dirk says, it doesn't prove your point. It doesn't support your point. So evolutionists are only looking for similarities when they go through the fossil record. And so here's something that would be helpful for you to understand, and that is that when we're talking, when we're using terminology here, evolutionists will talk about species of creatures. They want that to mean the same thing as the Bible calls kind. You remember the word kind in Genesis chapter 1? That, these, that these, these different creations, these different creatures, they reproduced after their kind. What does that mean? 
a dog is going to have a dog. Why? Because it's, it's a canine. It's after its kind. What, 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 is, what is a hippopotamus going to have? Is it going to have a kangaroo? No. Well, no, it's not after its kind. But what the evolutionists want to do is they want to say, oh, that kind is the same thing as, as what we're talking about when they're talking about species. But it's not. Uh, and and, and if, you, if you look at this, the word kind as it's being used in Genesis chapter 1 uh, is not talking about species. It's more talking about uh, the genus or the family groupings that science would have. But here's, here's maybe a chart that will help you. Here are the canine proto-species, okay? Um, now, are there similarities in all of these creatures? Um, are they after their kind? Here's a question for you. In, on the ark, would there have to have been dingoes and, and dogs and jackals and wolves and foxes and coyotes? Would there have to have been two of all of these? Or did God create the canine family, the canine kind, to have all of these different types all within it? Did God create it to have? Now, are there differences between these? Yeah, and we see the differences. Are there similarities between these? Yeah. And, and, we, and we, see, we see the similarities. Uh, and so, when, at, when uh, not Adam and Eve, who was on the ark, when Noah and Mrs. Noah, and their three sons and the daughter and the, and the wives, were on the ark, were there differences among those eight people? You think they all looked alike? They were not all alike. Were they similar? They were similar, and yet they were different. Now, in your mind, you've got a picture of what those eight people look like. And I can probably almost guarantee you, whatever your picture of what is those people look like, it's wrong. Um, because we manufacture the picture. Here's my guess. My guess is that when you picture those eight people, go ahead, get it in your mind, your picture of those eight people. My guess is you picture all of those eight people, same skin type, same skin pigmentation, same look. You want to prove how that can be? You want to prove that they were all looking alike in that way? Um, did God put within Adam and Eve every genetic uh, necessity for all of the diversity that there is among human beings? He put it all in them. Isn't that amazing to put it so? On the ark, there were eight people uh, that were going to repopulate. Probably we could say there were six people that were going to repopulate the earth. And everything that you see today came from those six people who were going to repopulate the earth. What about the dogs? What about the cats? You think that, do you think that, it, you think about all the cat varieties. That there, I, there's too many cat varieties for me. You think every single one of those cat varieties was on the ark? Can you, can you imagine being on the ark if there were every cat variety under heaven on the ark? No. What God put within that, that, that kind everything that was necessary in order for all of the other uh, types of those cats or those, what is that, feline? Is that the word that we're looking for? And so here's, here's, and here's the point that I'm trying to get to. That long list that we looked at where they have tried to, they have tried to separate out all of, and boy, it's way back there, isn't it? Um, where they have tried to separate out all, and they've tried to put all of these in the same category. All of the homo species and all of the uh, astropo, uh, I know I was going to mess that up, uh, Australopithecus. I said it right every time before I got here, uh, Australopithecus. They, they try to put all of that together, but they've actually figured out that they don't go together. Um, and so let me, give you a couple, let me give you a couple quotes and then we're going to move on. Here, here's a quote from uh, Lord Solly Zuckerman, who was a... Uh, uh, Oops, go back one. Um, who studied uh, anatomy, and uh, he studied the, uh, this, this Australopithecines, this grouping of ape-like creatures. He studied this, and he concluded that if man did descend from an ape-like ancestor, he did so, look at the quote, without leaving any fossil traces of the steps of that transformation. 
Think about what he just said. He said, if man came from these ape-like creatures, there's no evidence. There's, there's, there's nothing in the fossil record that would show that. Same thing from Ashley Montague, another evolutionist. He said, the skull form of all of these ape-like creatures shows too many specialized and ape-like characters to be either the direct ancestor of man or of the line that led to man. We pull up a couple other uh, evolutionary geologists and they also agree that when they're looking at these different uh, species, the Australopithecines or the homos, they should be placed separately from each other. So even these evolutionists are saying, wait a minute, th this certain line of the Australopithecines is separate from the Homo sapiens, the humans over here. If you go to the, the uh, Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, they will also, in their exhibit, draw a separation uh, between these ape-like creatures and the evolutionary, uh, the human evolutionary tree. Think about it. What's going on here? They're beginning to see that while there might be some microevolution between dogs and wolves uh, and, and foxes, that, there's, that they're all from that canine breed, as it were. And there's some differences in humans that they kind of look differently. And at one time there were some giants, you know, who could stand nine feet tall. And then sometimes there were some very short people and all the ones in between. But they say, oh, wait, no, all of those are in humans. But these ape-like creatures over here, for so long, they would put them in the same category as humans, but they've come to say, be honest enough to say, wait a minute, they don't belong in the same category. Let that sink in for a minute. What are they admitting? Differences. They don't admit differences. They're always looking for similarities. They're admitting differences. But what do they still believe in? They still believe in evolution. Why is that? How can you keep believing in something that keeps get, getting dismantled and disproven? The devil? They don't believe in God? Hmm. If they changed, they would have to admit that there's a God. It's hard to admit when you're wrong, isn't it? Is that hard? Now... If you would also admit that there's a God, now what have you got to do? You're not just changing your opinion about something. Now you're going to change your life. Hmm. Not going to have that. I'll just keep believing what I'm believing. Um, so we're trying to, to just look at this evidence that has been used and how even it's been dismantled by those who have been some of its strongest champions. Now, is there any other evidence that's been used to talk about evolution. Have you ever heard of vest, the vestigial organs? I remember, I remember textbook when I was in school that had this, this talk about vestigial organs. And what are vestigial organs? They're organs that you don't need. That's, that in, in essence, that's, that's what they want you to believe. They believe that through the evolutionary process, you've got some leftovers. Do you have leftovers in your fridge? Through the evolutionary process, there's some left, you've got some leftovers. You know, they were from, you know, they were from a, a previous evolutionary stage, and now that you're this, in this, per, this human uh, stage, you don't need those uh, anymore. There was a German uh, uh, anatomist uh, by the name of Robert Wiedersheim, and uh, back in 1895, he made a list of 86 organs. Did, did, did you even know you have 86 organs? He made a list of 86 organs that he considered to be holy or in part functionless. He said, you don't need these. Aren't you glad he didn't do surgery on you? Wouldn't that be fun? Oh, you don't need this. You know, it's like, you don't need this. We'll take this out. Now, what's happened over time with his list of 86 things is that one by one, we've come to realize, oh, wait, no, leave that there. Um, you know, the, these people actually... They actually need this. Um, and so, but the theory of evolution, it would have to predict that these exist, right? Amen. Because if you came from an ape, if, if, you came from a, if you came from a lizard, you think a lizard has some pieces and parts that you don't need when you're a human? 
And so, but if you came from that lizard, you don't need, so, but you would still have them. You know, still in your, in your evolutionary makeup, you'd still have all, but you don't need them anymore. Um, but that's not, that's not how it works. And so, you know some of these, some of these you might laugh at. But here are some of their, their favorite ones to say, no, man doesn't need these. He doesn't need wisdom teeth. You might think in America you don't need wisdom teeth, but how about in other cultures that need all the teeth they can get uh, in order to uh, uh, handle the, uh, a less processed diet than what you're used to? What about tonsils? Anybody ever had their tonsils taken out? I was four years old. I had my tonsils taken out. Uh, are tonsils good for anything? They're, they're put in our bodies to fight off germs. That's why God gave them to us. What about the appendix, Richard? I mean, uh, the, I mean uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Richard's like, hey, you know, take it or leave it. But when you're a kid, when you're a kid, that, that appendix is a part of your immune system and is designed by God to play an important part of your immune system. What about the parathyroid? Helps to regulate your calcium. What about hair? You need, I mean, take it or leave it, right? Some have it, some don't. Does it have a purpose? Guess what? It's got a purpose. Dan, does it have a purpose? You know what? Dan and Buzz and I right now are nice and cool. Of course, we're always cool, but we're, we're nice and cool. Those of you who have hair, you might be warm, all right, because you've got a little more insulation going on, all right? God gave it to you for insulation. When you're up in an attic and you don't have any hair, you better be careful not to hit your head on anything above because you don't have any extra cushion up there. Okay, um, I mean, am I talking truth here? I mean, you, you got it, you got to, you, so your hair had, but anyway, so here's Vettersheim who makes this list of 86 things and one by one, nope, 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 that's needed, that's needed, that's needed. And so old textbooks used to talk about vestigial organs. They don't talk about them so much anymore because it's been taken out of their toolbox. So guess what they talk about now? Now they talk about vestigial DNA. Now they talk about junk, what's called junk, they call it junk DNA. Same concept. Evolution would say, you've got organs in you you don't need because they came from a previous line of, of, of evolution. Well, they would also have to say, what about DNA? They would have to say that there's, that there's DNA that is left over uh, from, uh, from previous lines of the evolutionary process. So here's what they argue. Here's what evolutionists argue. When a trait is no longer used or becomes reduced, the genes that make it don't instantly disappear from the genome. Evolution stops their action by inactivating them, not stipping them out. So evolution just turns them off. Did you know that evolution turned off some of your DNA? From this, we can make a prediction. So evolutionists are making a prediction. We expect to find silenced or dead genes. They were once useful, but they, no longer, they are no longer intact or expressed. In other words, they are vestigial genes. So the organ, the organ argument kind of died on them. They, 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 could, they couldn't handle it. So now they're going into something more complex, right? More, more, more complex where who's going to look at their DNA and really understand if their DNA is something, you know, if, they're, if they've got genes left over or not. Well, it's interesting that one of their own, a molecular and a cell biologist by the name of Jonathan Wells, he wrote a book. You know what the name of the book was? The Myth of junk DNA. Think about this. An evolutionist, a part of this grouping of individuals that say, oh no, we ought to, we ought to be able to find junk DNA inside, inside, and he says, his book, The Myth of That. So here's what he says. He says, the arguments of Dawkins, and I know these aren't on the screen, these names, the arguments of, of a variety of prominent evolutionists, and he lists about seven of them. Their arguments rest on the premise that most non-protein coding DNA 
is junk without any significant biological function. Yet a virtual flood of recent evidence shows that they are mistaken. Much of the DNA they claim to be junk actually performs important functions in living cells. And so this is the beginning of his book. And so he says the following chapters cite hundreds of scientific articles that testify to those functions. And those articles are only a small sample of a large and growing body of literature on the subject. What's happening here? You had an evolutionist come up and say, oh, here's all these organs you don't need. And they started, yeah, wait a minute, you still need them. And now you have, well, let's, let's look at all this DNA you don't need anymore. And all of a sudden, no, oh, wait, no. Yeah, that, 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 has, that has a function too. Notice they keep making predictions. And what happens to those predictions? They don't hold. Why is that? Because they're trying to prove something that cannot be proven that humans have evolved from a single cell organism. You can't prove it. Let, we, we've got just a few minutes. Let, let, me go, let me go to one more. Let me see. Which one of these do I want to do? Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know we have similarities with, with chimps. Um, what they want you to believe is that we are 98%. We are, we, we are, our makeup, specifically our DNA, they want you to believe we're 98 to 97, 99% same in our DNA. Um, and what they have found is that it, their own writings say they're, they're not looking at qualitative differences between chimps and humans uh, in their DNA. And in fact, I love this particular quote. The quote says... The laws of chance tell us that two random sequences from species that have no ancestry in common will match at about one in every four sites. You remember DNA, right? You, you, you remember A, G, C, T? You remember the, you, you only got four parts of DNA. And so you, you, can, you can take those four parts and you just mix them up, but you still only have four parts. Well, they say then there's about a one in four uh, that, uh, that is going to match in one in four sites. Thus, two unrelated DNA sequences will be 25% identical, not 0%. Do flowers have DNA? They do. So you match flowers 25% of the time in DNA. Are you like a flower? You're not like a flower. Allison looks like a flower. But, but God, so God, sh should it surprise us? And some... Some people say, oh, no, no, no. If there's similarities, that proves evolution. Hang on a second. If you were God, if you created DNA, if you had created DNA, wouldn't that be cool? I mean, could you patent it? You could make a lot of money, right? If you created DNA, would you say, oh, I'm only going to put that in the humans. I'm not going to put it in any other living creature. If you perfected something like DNA, would you put it in other living creatures? What about chimps? They want you to believe that, that we're, and, and so we're not 98%, there are about an 80% similarity between us and chimps. But why would there be that many similarities? Well, because when God created a skeletal structure, guess what? He's like, hey, this works. This is a good idea for these various creatures. So he took these body structures and he used similar bodies. Does that mean we're they're the same? Well, no, it doesn't mean that we're the same. It just means that this creator, this designer, took elements from his creation. Do fish have bones? Don't you hate it when you eat fish and you get the bones? I mean, there, somebody didn't prepare it right if you get bone. So fish have bones, you have bones. So that means you're the same. What? Do, do, do fish have eyes? You know, do lizards have eyes? I mean, when, when you are a God, a designer, who creates an eyeball, are you going to say, well, I'm only going to put it in certain creatures, I won't put it, you know. When you perfect an eyeball, why are you going to change the eyeball? You know, it's like, this works, it sees it. And, and so, just because there are similarities, that should not throw us off um, to the fact that God has created all of these things. Now, don't misunderstand. Is there a difference, a quite significant difference, 
between humans and all of these other creations. We might have bones. We might have eyes. What's different? We've been made in the image of God. No other creation has. In Genesis chapter 1, you, you work through the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And it was not until verse 26 and 27 where God said, let us make mm in our image. What's the blank there? Not make the apes, not make the monkeys, not make the, the fish. Let us make man in our image. He didn't say that about any other creation. Just God, or just man. Just that special creation in which God put a soul. And that's what makes us different. There, there, is, there is so much on this topic. I would encourage you to go to the AP site. There's even a lot more in this lesson, and I'm not going to get to it. Uh, I'm not going to get to it tonight. But I hope you'll come back. we got Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. We've got different topics that we're going to be looking at uh, each night. One of those nights, we're going to be looking at the age of the earth. Um, you might not think that's an important topic to look at. Uh, guess what your children are being taught? This world is billions of years old. And if you believe it's only thousands of years old, you are so naive. Guess what? There's not evidence for it being billions of years old. I, I, I heard recently that if we can get that one truth into the minds of our children, it's not billions of years old, it's only thousands of years old, that that one truth might save them from falling into believing evolution. Just that one piece of the information. Anyway, that's not tomorrow night. That'll probably be Tuesday or Wednesday night. Thank you all for being here tonight. I believe there are snacks. If you want cookies or some kind of, it's not homemade cookies, so, you know, whatever. But uh, if you want some snacks, they're over in the family room.